Welcome to the World Shapers, conversations with authors about their books. I'm your host, Edward Willett, and this episode's guest, Robert J. Sawyer. We'll be talking about Robert's latest book, The Downloaded, coming May 7th from Shadowpaw Press. Welcome to episode 151 of The World Shapers. Now, usually when I introduce The World Shapers, I will say this is the podcast where I talk to other science fiction and fantasy authors about the creative process. However, I'm not quite doing that anymore. Uh, With this episode, I am now focusing on new releases. And I'll also be spreading my net a little wider and bringing in authors who aren't necessarily science fiction and fantasy authors. That said, uh, we are starting this new form of the podcast with a science fiction fantasy author, Robert J. Sawyer, who not coincidentally was the very first guest on the podcast way back in uh, August of 2018 when this all started, more than five years ago now, which is hard to believe. And we will be talking about uh, Rob's uh, latest book, The Downloaded, which uh, is actually being published by my publishing company, uh, Shadowpaw Press. Now, I am myself an author of science fiction and fantasy. My latest novel is uh, a little over a year ago now, was from Daw Books called The Tangled Stars. I strongly urge you (laughs) to look that up. It's a far future outer space humorous science fiction adventure featuring an AI uplifted talking cat who becomes a starship captain. What more could you want? However, A lot of my time recently has been spent on Shadowpaw Press, which has been growing. I have a very ambitious publishing schedule coming up in 2024, and one of those books is The Downloaded. Uh, The Downloaded has come out as an audiobook original. We'll be talking about this quite a bit. And uh, the print rights uh, have gone to Shadowpaw Press for U.S. and Canada. So uh, May 7th, when it launches, uh, that will have uh, Shadowpaw's uh, smiling face on the back of it. He's the cat uh, that gives the name to the publishing company. Uh, coming up much before that, however, and I will also be talking to these authors, uh, Nir Yaniv has a uh, satirical military science fiction novel called The Good Soldier that comes out January 23rd, very soon after this podcast goes live. Uh, there's also a uh, dystopian YA science fiction novel set in Canada by Mark Morton, who's a distinguished nonfiction writer. This is his science fiction debut. And Rob, who's who's on the uh, podcast, uh, this episode of the podcast, uh, loved it, gave it a great blurb. Also, we have the fourth anthology, Shapers of Worlds, Volume 4, which features authors who have been guests on this podcast in the fourth year. And I'm already talking to the authors from the fifth year uh, about Shapers of Worlds, Volume 5, so there'll be a Kickstarter happening again for that. Uh, Going forward, I don't know. There might be a Shapers of Worlds, Volume 6, or I might call it something else and take a slightly different focus on it, just as I have uh, with the podcast. We'll see. So that's where we're at. Uh, This is episode 151 of The World Shapers. The guest is Robert J. Sawyer. I'll start with a little introduction, and then we'll get right into the uh, the interview. Robert J. Sawyer, the Dean of Canadian Science Fiction, according to the CBC, and the Globe and Mail and Maclean's bestseller, is the only Canadian to have won all three of the world's top awards for Best Science Fiction Novel of the Year, the Hugo, the Nebula, and the John W. Campbell Memorial Award. A member of both the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario, Rob has won more Canadian science fiction and fantasy awards, Auroras, than anyone else in history. The ABC TV series Flash Forward was based on his novel of the same name, and the downloaded, which we'll be talking about, is his 25th novel. A popular TEDx and keynote speaker with more than 700 radio and TV interviews under his belt, Rob physically lives in Mississauga, and in cyberspace, he's at sfwriter.com. So, Rob, welcome back to the World Shapers. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, Ed. And, of course, you were my very first guest on the very first episode of the original five-year run, (laughs) five-year mission of the World Shapers, uh, where I interviewed the science fiction fantasy authors about their creative process. And I thought it was appropriate to have you back here for episode 151, which is uh, the first of the new format. It's still me, still talking to authors, but it's going to be a wide variety of authors, and I'm going to be focused... Uh, more on new releases uh, and whatever comes out of that discussion, but it won't be quite the uh, the detailed look at people's creative process that I was doing before. And so we're here to talk about uh, the downloaded. And uh, well, well, we'll talk about our unique connection on that one a little later on. But why don't we start with you describing uh, what the downloaded is about? Sure. The downloaded is about two very disparate groups who, for plot reasons, have their consciousnesses uploaded into a virtual reality existence. One group 
is astronauts. They're on Earth's first interstellar voyage. Their consciousness is being stored while supposedly their cryogenically frozen bodies are being shipped to another star system. The other group is prisoners who've been offered a deal that should be better for them and better for the state. The deal is this. You guys are all convicted of serious crimes. We'll reduce your sentences to 20 years. But those 20 years can be served in virtual reality by putting your consciousness into a computer where the passage of time will be sped up. That means that you'll actually get out in just a few months, back to your lives, back to your children, back to your families, back maybe to your jobs. And um, uh, the state will have nonetheless recorded that you served your 20 years of time and you'll be free to go. So it's appropriate for both groups to be uploaded. They happen to be uploaded into the same quantum computing facility in Canada's Quantum Valley, as my friend Mike Lazaridis, co-founder of BlackBerry, the research in motion, calls it uh, our quantum so you computing name dropped capital. In, name dropped in the book, I know. Who I name drop in the book, and, I'll, and we'll get to that perhaps because he gave a very key plot element to the book, I must say. But um, supposedly everything is going to go fine, but it wouldn't be a novel if it didn't. Did, in fact, uh, everything does not go fine, and the people end up being downloaded five hundred years later, and the astronauts and the prisoners seem to be the only survivors on Earth. And these two very disparate groups, one that has very definitionally the right stuff, the astronauts, and ones who have, according to uh, the law, the wrong stuff, the criminals have to find some way to live together in this new, no longer virtual reality. Yeah, it's a very, it's it's a, it's a, a fun book. Uh, I guess fun is the right word. Intellectually fun, I think. <laughs> Considering I love, what happens yeah, but, in it, it's not course. necessarily fun, but. <laughs> it, you know, I, I like to think it's fun. Uh, and also you use that word intellectual. Uh, you know, blurbs very nicely came in from a bunch of writers in advance of publication, and they all appear on the first interior page of the forthcoming Shadowpaw Press edition Yay. of the downloaded. But for the cover, uh, I picked two words. Sylvain Nouvel, who is one of the hottest uh, science fiction writers around these days, happens to live in Montreal, uh, gave a nice long blur, but I took two words out. Wicked smart, which I think is... Uh, a really good summation of this. It is fun. It is fast paced. Hopefully it is heart wrenching and moving. But above all else, I like to think of it as a, a real mind bender and a real mind expander The downloaded. Yeah, I think that's fair. And uh, of course, I won't always have managed to read the books that I talk about on the podcast, but I certainly read that one because yes, you did. Mean, uh, it's being published by uh, in print by my Shadowpaw Press. But before that, it is already out in audio. So how did that all come about? How did the downloaded so begin and get the downloaded an audio book? The downloaded is on a long journey to get to where we are about are right now, which is for it to be about to be released in print. Um, I was approached uh, way back in the beginning of uh, 2000, I think, so four years ago now, by Audible. Uh, and uh, they said, you know, we want to get back into doing original production. We look at Netflix. Netflix has uh, started out just distributing other people's content. That was Audible's model too. They weren't making audiobooks. They were distributing from recorded books and Tantor Media and other places. They wanted to get into their own original production just as Netflix now makes most of its money not by distributing other people's content, but by th their original productions that are exclusive to them. Great, I was interested. And it was going to be done for Audible Canada, which ironically is headquartered in New Jersey, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, where the rest of Audible is. So they were coming to me and a few other major uh, Canadian writers, including my friend Andrew Piper, and uh, asked us if we would create originals for them. Well, this sounded great, and we uh, enlisted Gregory J. Sinclair, who used to be one of the key radio drama producers for the CBC to direct and produce this production. We're all set. We're going to do full cast, interactive radio drama kind of thing with sweet and with sound effects. And then COVID-19 hit. And the edict come down from Audible. Hey, wait a minute, guys. We don't know if we can get more than one actor into studio at a time because of COVID protocols. So you got to re-envision the whole thing. And... Um, 
uh, it was Greg who said Rashomon, which, of course, is the Akira Kurosawa film that's told as a series of individual perspectives on the same events being given as testimony to, uh, in, in that case, a, a, a real judge. And I thought, he's got it. Greg's got it. That's the template. So we re-envisioned the whole thing as uh, nine different viewpoint characters, each presenting a portion of the testimony, sometimes overlapping, sometimes conflicting, about how this uh, mess of the prisoners and the astronauts uh, ending up 500 in the years in the future came about. Well, Audible paid me very handsomely. I have no complaints whatsoever about what they paid me, although I'm sure they paid Brendan Fraser <laughs> even more to star in it. Um, and uh, thereby hangs a tale too. But uh, Audible, of course, had the audiobook rights. Well, as you well know, Ed, as a author who's done lots of work on your own for DAW, uh, you know, the big five New York publishers all insist not just on your print rights, but also your ebook rights and your audiobook rights. Mm -hmm. And I had been having great success with my own ebook rights. Uh, my Oppenheimer alternative, I went to a couple of small presses for the print version of that because uh, I knew I could make a lot of money off of ebooks, and I did. Um, and uh, I knew that the big five, Penguin Random House Canada, who had been my most recent publisher, Tor and, and A Science Fiction, their partner in the States, a Tor before that, they would not agree to let me keep the ebook rights and they would be wanting the audiobook rights, so it's already encumbered by Audible. And then you and I happened to be at the otherwise execrable North American Science Fiction Convention in Winnipeg <laughs> called Pemmican, yes, uh, which was, was a terrible, terrible. Yeah, go ahead. Worst convention uh, I've ever been at. Yeah. Me too. And, and you and I have been going to conventions since the previous millennium. And this is the worst convention we're both ever at. But we happen to be chatting. We're old friends. Uh, we've known each other for decades. And I knew you had Shadow Paw Press. And you knew I had uh, possibly something coming up. And we had a conversation and came to uh, terms that made sense for you and for me uh, to have the print edition come out. And I'm so proud because you have such a great line of books. And you are meticulous in the quality uh, of uh, production that your your company does, unlike a lot of smaller presses. Um, you know, I think it's I'm so, because I'm an author and I know what it's like to work. That's with right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, you bring you bring a level of uh, sophistication and care to the enterprise that immediately apparent. And you know, you've added names to your roster besides me. I like to think I'm one of your bigger names, but you're publishing uh, the final two novels by the great Canadian science fiction fantasy hall of fame inductee. Dave Duncan, of course, passed away some years ago, but uh, Dr. Robert Runte, uh, who is his literary executor, lives in Lethbridge, Alberta, has shepherded these two to publication through you. Arthur Slade, Arthur Slade, Governor General's Award winner, uh, is now part of the Shadowpaw stable. So I feel very much that um, this, you know, people would look at it, you know, kind of, well, the guy used to be with Penguin. And now he's with, what's going on? I, well, you know, there are a lot of good people who used to be with Penguin, uh, or Tor for that matter, who are looking for alternatives that make more sense than their big five traditional publishing model here in now that we're well into uh, the 21st century. And I think it's going to be win-win for you and win-win for me. I'm certainly looking forward to bringing it out. And uh, as I said, I have read it. Uh, I'll tell you as you it. should before I did, you I did find the I did find a typo you might have missed everybody oh, might well, have let me know because I got to get will. it fixed because it was in the I air. got some typos by the way in your upcoming um the headmasters by Mark yes, Morton which I read no I've got more I haven't sent you them oh, all got yet more. I, I got to get organized print, so. <laughs> when well you yes I, I will try to get them to you shortly things on my plate right but I I did capture some more uh Mark Morton a, 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 a first time novelist that you're publishing, who's one of Canada's best known food writers, of course, and CBC columnist and so and I'm, forth. And I'm actually republishing his book, uh, Cabinet of, uh, oh, what's it called now? <laughs> anyway, it's his it's a glossary of culinary terms. Oh, but, wonderful. Yeah. But so I, I mean, it's, yeah, so I, uh, besides the list uh, we've already mentioned, the Arthur Slade 
and uh, the uh, Dave Duncan and my the downloaded, uh, you've got this terrific Mark Morton uh, book, The Headmasters, kind of a an update riff on um, Robert A. Heinlein's The Puppet Masters or maybe Stephanie Meyer's um, uh, The Host. Uh, very interesting book, and I was delighted to blurb that. And interestingly, it's set somewhere up uh, near Sudbury. So, <laughs> Absolutely, which I have, of course, set three novels there. My Neanderthal Parallax yes, trilogy, the Hugo winner, Hominid, uh, Hugo nominee, uh, Humans, and uh, hominid, uh, Hybrids, the third in the series, Hominids, Humans, and Hybrids, Sudbury, Ontario. Yeah. So knowing that you were writing for audio, and I mean, you have this 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 uh, Rashomon <laughs> template, if you like, uh, but... Did you change your style of writing in any other way for a book that was going straight to audio? Were you thinking? So, yeah, normally terms? I did. I did. Um, because normally uh, I like to think of myself as an evocative, descriptive writer. And uh, when you're doing and, and this required a shift, and I've done it before. My novel Calculating God, for instance, is a first person uh, narrative. But most of my books, indeed most modern fiction, is third person limited narration. He said, she said, which allows the narrator to come in and say, the sky was a cerulean blue with ripples of cirrus just drifting across on the zephyr, which nobody would ever say as spoken dialogue. So once the decision was made that we were gonna present it as audio testimony, then a lot of descriptive stuff that I would have enjoyed doing um, doesn't get into the book unless it's something the character would comment on. And then you have to do it in the way the character would comment on. Eh, a nice blue sky or, you know, a few wisps of cloud, but not a, none of that uh, purple prose that you might otherwise employ uh, in straightforward third person narration. It's like writing, a, a well, obviously a radio play, but a stage play where everything has to be told through dialogue. Um, I mean, you can present some things on stage and radio, of course you can't, but it, it's really just a series of monologues is what it is. And it, and it was, was very interesting, uh, cause I've never, I've written monologues within scenes, you know, where a character has gone off on a, on a bit of a speech, but the monologue is a very respectable dramatic form in its own right. And you know, that actors who are, uh, trying to learn how to, um, uh, act will buy a book of monologues, right? Because you can do a monologue without an acting partner, right? And you use them for and auditions as well. You use them for auditions. You've got a monologue going there. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that I love about classic Star Trek is when Kirk is on a, a tear, risk, risk is our business. That's what the starship is all about. That's why we're aboard her, right? Great monologues. Um, but uh, it's interesting because right now, and this, you're learning this for the first time, but um, Audible and I have uh, both agreed, and I own the film uh, rights uh, to the downloaded, uh, that uh, we, it should be developed as a, a feature film. Oh, I think so, uh, and, yeah. and so uh, we had a, our big kickoff conversation about that last week. And of course, the first thing I said, I got to re-envision the whole project and you got to pay me. Uh, to do under my Writers Guild of America contract, blah, 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 to do uh, a treatment because you can't do a film as nine people speaking into the camera for a total of 90 minutes. It has to be fully dramatized. So we go from that stage play metaphor. And you could you do it as a stage play as is. You absolutely could, but it's not nearly as lucratively <laughs> as doing it as a feature film. So, so our plan is a, is a feature. Uh, which I'm excited about, obviously, but it means going back and again, though, uh, as you say, in a stage play, and even feature even more so, uh, the stage direction is so minuscule. Exterior day, instead of that cerulean sky with the serious uh, clouds blowing on the zephyr, exterior day, you don't even say that, you say ext, EXT period day, you get six characters to set up the scene, right? And then you just go from there. So it'll be, I, I love all these different dramatic formats for writing in. And I've done two commissioned feature film screenplays before. I've got a degree in, uh, you know, uh, radio and television arts from the now blandly renamed Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly 
Ryerson. Uh, this is in my blood to work in that medium, film and television. Um, but uh, I, it's a challenge to re-envision, to properly re-envision so that you're taking full advantage of the strengths of whatever given medium you're writing in. And I think actually still my favorite version, although Brendan Fraser and Luke Kirby and, and uh, Vanessa Sears, who were our stars uh, in the audible version, my favorite version is still the print version that you're doing because there were a lot of little, uh, you know, grace notes of description that were lost, you know, character would say something he said wistfully while staring heavenward right well that it's just the character says the line and then uh it's all that description was edited out in the audible version but it's there in the prose text novel that you're publishing i was going to ask what the differences were between the audio and the and obviously that's one of them uh, in and fact you think the experience of reading it will be different than the experience of listening listening to, to it in fact, uh, we were having this conversation, as I said last week, about adapting it to film. And the head of adaptation uh, for Audible Studios, the person who they use to license and, and uh, sell uh, film and TV rights to their original properties, uh, said, oh, I'm going to re-listen. I've listened to it twice. I'm going to listen to it again. I said, no, no, no. I want you to read it because there is a lot of nuance in the text that got chopped out in... Uh, in the uh, dialogue as presented in the uh, audio production. Now there's additional nuance that a great Academy Award winning actor like Brendan Kirby or a great um, Emmy Award winning actor like Luke Kirby or a great Dora Maver, Mavermore uh, theater uh, veteran like um, uh, Vanessa Sears bring to it that perhaps wasn't in my text. But if we're gonna go back to adapting, we're adapting my novel, we're not adapting Audible's audio production. Obviously, because of the structure with the monologues, it's very important that you found the right characters to tell the story. So how yes. did you how did you do that? How did you decide the character? And they, there are a wide variety of them. We have, you know, the convicted murderer, we have the the doctor, the starship captain. Um, there's a, a fascinating selection of characters. How did you decide who you needed to tell the story? Well, it's interesting. I decided off right off the bat, uh, it was about the astronauts first. So the two main astronaut characters are you got to have a ship's captain. Um, all due respect to Lower Decks, the Star Trek animated series, the captain is usually the most interesting character on a starship. Uh, and so obviously there's going to be a captain. And then I wanted um, somebody in some degree of sort of a conflict um, frenemy, let's say, frenemy relationship with that captain. And uh, again, my Star Trek roots show, uh, the ship's doctor becomes that character. Now, of course, I'm mixing it up. Uh, the captain is a an African-American woman. The ship's doctor is a Canadian uh, of German descent. Uh, and uh, they have a very different dynamic than Kirk and McCoy. Um, but uh, I wanted to have uh, sort of these characters. And then as soon as I got into that paradigm, these characters, they have the right stuff. There's a certain boring quality. Uh, if you've read Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff or seen the movie based on it, uh, there's a certain sameness uh, because once you reach that elite level of physical and intellectual performance required to become an astronaut, uh, the interesting quirks and personality things uh, are so few and far between. You look at how many of the astronauts that have been in there have actually become famous as personalities. Buzz Aldrin, uh, kind of, and Chris Hadfield, a friend of mine, great Canadian astronaut, who famously, of course, uh, played, um, you know, Commander Tom uh, on his guitar up in the International Space Station. Um, uh, that kind of thing, uh, Major Tom, excuse me, Earth, you know, Major Tom, um, that kind of thing is so rare amongst astronauts to have. And now he's writing little... books. I mean, and now he's writing books. Chris is writing. He's, he's, yeah, I didn't go to space, Chris. You stay out of my my uh, wheelhouse and I'll stay out of yours. OK, bucko. <laughs> but yeah, he's writing. Obviously, uh, he's got two now. He's got two of his novels out now. Uh, the Apollo Murders and um, 
Oh, I forget what the other one. Yeah, is I just called. got it for Christmas. So I yeah, read, yeah. I haven't got. I've gotten both. The but... There's something about. Yes, the, I think it is it's called, called the, the defector. defector. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, uh, but once you get into that paradigm of writing about all these people with the right stuff, like, ah, man, I would like some people who are a little more down and dirty, a little more flawed, a little more Joe average, and the flip side, very much, and it's a motif throughout the story. The wrong stuff. Well, who is the wrong stuff? It's criminals, right? Um, definitionally, they have the wrong stuff. And um, I started developing the character of uh, who I think really ended up being the spine of the piece and the lead more than anything, uh, Roscoe Kudulian, who uh, is, yes, a murderer, but uh, he murdered his childhood tormentor, uh, when his childhood tormentor had started tormenting him again as an adult, and he sought him down in a fit of rage. He only just wanted to confront him in a fit of rage uh, because he'd been triggered by an insult from his past that the tormentor used against him. He kills him with garden shears that happened to be at hand. So he's a murderer, but a murderer who had had it to do over absolutely would do it over again. It would not do it over again. Would would. You know, and and is on a road to redemption uh, through this uh, prison system. So the he's, counterpoint he's actually the one that has the the character arc. He's the he one has a real character he arc. He developed the most. Yeah, sorry, he absolutely does. And you know, steal from the best because his character arc is a little bit similar. And he even refers to us when he's asked uh, his name at one point. <laughs> and um, we left this in in the audio production uh, because uh, it's actually in narrative. He says you know, in the narration, which is written as first person, but not supposed to, I thought about saying um, 50321. Uh, fi what, what the hell, uh, John Valjean's number. Yeah, I knew it a second uh, ago. <laughs> I did it too, I, until I said it around long, right? Uh, who are you, I'm, uh, anyways, yes, he says Jean Valjean's prisoner number from Les Miserables, well, of course, Jean Valjean, is a guy who committed a petty crime, and in his case, for good reasons, to feed his starving uh, sister's daughter, um, serves his time and goes on to become the mayor of the town. And uh, that very much is echoed in Roscoe Cadulian's journey. So when you're gonna steal, steal from the best. So with the uh, book coming up, um... That's coming out May 7th, we should say, is the release date. And you've got planned a fairly extensive, uh, uh, I've been watching the emails come my way, <laughs> a fairly extensive uh, support tour for this. Across Absolutely. The this is one of the things I felt, you know, I'm very proud of my previous novel, The Oppenheimer Alternative. Uh, we were all set with a Canada-US book tour, book launches scheduled both in Toronto and in um, New Mexico, where of course the Los Alamos Laboratory was, and then COVID hit. Not only were uh, my, my tour canceled, but most bookstores were closed. Uh, and it just never got the launch it deserved. And so I'm determined for the uh, downloaded to uh, uh, hit that festival circuit again. So I'm already booked for uh, a couple of major literary festivals, uh, British Columbia and uh, Saskatchewan. I'm sure I'm going to be booked for several more. I'm querying more this week. Uh, bookstore signings, public library events, the whole shebang. Our official book launch is actually a joint book launch for my book, The Downloaded, and The Trader's Son, the last science fiction novel by Dave Duncan, which we're having on that official pub date. So you better not miss it, dude. <laughs> on Tuesday, May 7th at the Calgary Public Library Central Branch in their big auditorium there where uh, Robert Runte, who uh, finished uh, Dave's book for him, and I will be on stage and we're billing it as a night of Canadian science fiction and uh, Owl's Nest, uh, the venerable Calgary bookseller, be on hand selling books. And uh, we're hoping for a really uh, vibrant launch party for those two novels. Well, I'm I'm uh, going to wrap this up pretty soon, but there is one thing I wanted to circle back to. And you've often said that you actually, I think you would, you have sometimes said that science fiction, you would prefer it was called philosophical fiction. For, yes, fi fi, uh, not sci fi. <laughs> That's right. And so, in fact, one of my fans gave me a lovely shirt that, uh, a t shirt, world's best fi fi author, which I, uh, I also noticed in the book where you said, uh, you know, this went from science fiction. That is a, 
carefully a, reasoned. A, a, a <laughs> rational, <laughs> reasonable extrapolation from what we already know to what possibly might be, probably as, might be. As yes. opposed to the way that's usually used, where it's that's all right. that's for science fiction. Yeah. That's I right, exactly. Because it drives <laughs> me nuts when people, even people who should know better say that's just science fiction or actually yeah. surprised and move from science fiction to science fact, the rocket, the, uh, the computer, like, yeah, they were going to because we were ears to the ground. We serious science fiction writers are so in tune with what's at the bleeding edge of science and technology. We have a network of real scientists that we keep in touch to. We read uh, popular science for sure, technical stuff, cutting edge stuff. We know what's going on. When we make a prediction, we may be predicting it as a cautionary tale. If this goes on, we're going to have mass surveillance everywhere and no freedom anywhere. Or we're predicting it because it's obvious that this is the inevitable outcome of that line of research. But for science fiction to be used as a dismissive thing, and I always correct people, well, that's just uh, merely science fiction. Oh, you mean that's merely fantasy? Because science fiction is things that plausibly might happen, and fantasy is things that never could happen. I don't, in the context of this conversation, make a value judgment about which one is better, but they are distinctly different. And to use science fiction as, oh, that's just crazy science fiction stuff. Uh, there's no such thing as crazy science fiction stuff. So with this book, and I'm going to borrow, uh, uh, John Scalzi has a, uh, on his blog, The Big Idea, where people, I've done a few of those, where you talk about the big idea behind a book. Yes, I have yeah. on my calendar the exact day that John <laughs> will accept a, a submission for The Big Idea for the downloader. I've done a been lucky enough to have John select me in the past. So this could well be a, for that. This could be a trial run. What was the big idea behind the downloaded? And also what were some of the the smaller ideas that bubbled up and that you explored uh, that people can uh, look forward to to reading your take on or not, depending on how they feel about. So <laughs> this is actually a theme that I've gone back to because it was also in my novel Quantum Night. The theme is the worst canard that humanity has ever sold itself is you can't change human nature. We change human nature all the time. We change it for the better. Uh, most times, nine times out of 10, we've improved uh, our definition of what personhood is, our willingness to accept uh, diversity, our cooperative tendencies, our pacifism. All these things have been in the ascendant throughout human history. And um, uh, there's this defeatist attitude uh, you know, not to get too political, but when Donald Trump says make America great again, the again means go back. It means make it what it was before. And uh, I am a huge believer in the forward progress. I'm a Steven Pinker uh, fan in that he wrote The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, believer that forward progress is not only the only thing that's going to save humanity, but in fact is our historical record. So the downloaded with this cast of characters who have to learn to be better people than they were, uh, I, I think is an absolute um, th absolute theme of the book. The smaller themes are, um, you know, and it had, it had a tragic um, resonance actually, because when I was writing the book, everybody goes into cryogenic suspension. Well, who do I know who's in cryogenic suspension? Walt Disney. Can't ask him. He's still frozen. Who else? Uh, nobody but my friend Greg Benford, the great American hard science fiction writer, uh, has signed up with Alcor, the world's leading uh, cryonics firm. And I don't mention Alcor by name in the book, but I say, um, you know, it's kind of ironic that you can be the world's leading firm. They, the company I use um, is called Cold Boot. They're going to reboot you. It's Cold Boot. Um, is uh, I say of them, they've got great five-star reviews of everything, their grounds, their staff, everything, but that thing that they're actually selling you on being able to do, which is reviving you after you've been clinically dead and bringing you back to life, right? Anyways, Greg uh, has signed up for Alcor many, many years ago, and I talked to him while I was writing these cryonic things, and he sent me some stuff he'd written about it and so forth. Well, Greg subsequently, in fact, just over a year ago, had a massive stroke. And uh, so uh, 
when he does finally pass, and I hope it's many years from now, uh, and Alcor does receive his body per his instructions, they won't just be bringing back a guy who got hit by a car, and that's straightforward, uh, you know, surgery and corrective stuff to bring back to life, perhaps, but somebody who's already had massive cerebral damage and try and bring that person back at a level that person would want to be resuscitated at. So this this whole notion of trying to cheat death through cryonics uh, is a secondary theme of the book. And uh, I always come back to, you know, The Simpsons is Matt Groening's uh, cartoon series. But he got that cartoon series because he had a very popular underground comic prior to that called Life in Hell. And in Life in Hell, one of my favorite cartoons, they have these two... Uh, uh, characters who are fezzes they're um, akbar and jeff and uh, they open a series of businesses and they have akbar and jeff's cryonics hut where their slogan is where the elite meet to beat the heat and avoid having to greet saint pete <laughs> and i just love that right and this whole notion that any number of things whether it's that of the fountain of youth or or uh, vitamins and and um, supplements, Greg Bear also is actually markets a line of longevity supplements. Uh, all of that is so part of human nature to try and cheat death and it never works and it's never going to work in the way that the people who hope it's going to work will work. Oh yeah, you might be cryogenically frozen. Well, guess what? By the time they decide to defaw, dethaw, dethaw you, thaw you, defrost you <laughs> you're a freak of nature you're way out of the times and the world has changed in the case of the downloaded so horribly that you would wish in a lot of meaningful ways that you hadn't been revived that's i would say theme number two of what is otherwise the upbeat cheerful you know uh the downloaded in a way it has a uh happy ending i mean it's not the end of everything i think it has an uplifting ending. An we don't want to give any spoilers yeah. there but i labored over that to make it end on a grace note uh that was uplifting and you may remember uh again not to spoil the ending but uh old time movie quotes are a theme yeah. <laughs> and uh the first quote that a, a character uses at the end is from the end of as as he says, the vastly underrated beneath the planet of the apes <laughs> in one of the countless billions of galaxies in the universe, a deep blue, a green and insignificant planet is now dead, which is like a downer ending. And everybody goes on him and says, that's a downer ending. And then he tries again and gives us the uplifting ending that the downloaded does indeed have. Well, I'm very much looking forward to bringing out the print edition, uh, North American print rights. Um, so the that's all in the works. Um, and October 7th, it will make its... Uh, no, <laughs> no, May sorry, 7th. May 7th. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be bad, wouldn't it? Uh, May 7th, it, it will make its uh, publication date and shipping date. I'm quite confident in all that. And uh, I want to thank you uh, very much for coming on and, and talking about it and for joining the Shadowpaw Press stable of authors. <laughs> I'm absolutely thrilled, Ed. Thank you so much for having me here and in your stable. And bye for now. And uh, thanks again to Rob for that great interview. It was great to have him back on. He's my first repeat guest, but there will be some other repeat guests as well, because now that the uh, World Shapers is focused on uh, books more than the creative process, there will be an opportunity for authors I've spoken to in the past to come on whenever they have a, a new release. Uh, so I'm still sort of feeling my way, lining up guests, but uh, there should be a lot of interesting conversations yet to come. Uh, on the World Shapers as it continues. That does wrap it up for this time. I will just mention a few things. Uh, you can find me online at edwardwillett.com. That's two T's on Willett. You can find the World Shapers online at theworldshapers.com. You can find me on Twitter at, uh, sorry, X, at eWillett. And you can find the World Shapers at the World Shapers. And we're both on Instagram as well. Uh, actually, The World Shapers isn't on Instagram. No, it's not. I'm on Instagram, however, at Edward Willett Author. And on Facebook at Edward.Willett. The World Shapers is on Facebook at The World Shapers. You can find me on YouTube. In fact, you may be finding this podcast on YouTube because uh, it's part of my channel. It's just uh, youtube.com slash Edward Willett. And indeed, 
in 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 addition to this podcast, you can uh, walk with me around my home city of Regina, Saskatchewan. Walking in Regina has been a, a popular thing that I've been doing now for two and a half years, I think. Uh, so you might want to check that out as well. Shadowpaw Press, which will be publishing the downloaded, which we just talked about, is at shadowpawpress.com. You can find it on X at Shadowpaw Press, on uh, Facebook at Shadowpaw Press, and on Instagram at Shadowpaw Press. That's it for this episode of The World Shapers. I hope you enjoy the new format, and I hope that you will continue to come back and uh, and meet some other great authors and hear some more about some of the wonderful books that are coming out in the near future. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.